assalamu alaikum and very good evening welcome you all to our weekly virtual sessions on gynecological malignancies today our topic is lecture series and it is on the non epithelial ovarian tumor we have covered all the things about the epithelial ovarian tumor except the chemotherapy in epithelial ovarian cancer and we think we should be we can get this lecture on 3rd october and renowned medical oncologist professor dr vinet talwar will deliver the lecture on the chemotherapy in ovarian malignancy on 3rd october today we will be discussed on the non epithelial ovarian tumor and our faculties today are the local faculty is dr sushmita bordhon she has passed fcps gynae oncology this year we are very much happy for her and today is our another proud moment that this year i want to share it with all our the participants in this platform and also the our mentor dr ak one of our mentor dr ak goodman that um, around uh, 19 the candidates were appeared in fcps gynae oncology this year among this 15 has 14 has passed in written examination and among them 13 qualified and they are uh, now the qualified gynae oncologist and or not only that qualified they are the established gynae oncologist in our country and we are happy that this field the our the gynae oncologist we are we the endist our gynae oncologist and we think the our we can treat our patients in fusar in soon more carefully with our if we can uh, increase the number of the gynae oncologist we can uh, treat the patients according to the guideline and according to the all the in the proper manner so our patients will get proper treatment and from the platform of the oncology club our president professor dr m a haisar they will congratulate the all the candidates today in this platform this is the first meeting of their examination the local faculty is dr sushmita bordon and another faculty with the foreign faculty dr ak goodman she is an oncologist the professor of obstetrics and gynecology reproductive biology harvard medical school boston ua this program is running through the oncology on the platform under the platform of the oncology club where the scientific secretary of this club is dr a m kamaluddin and our the general secretary dr a m sharifud alam and also the who is the always inspirator of us professor dr a m hai sir under his umbrella we are running this program and we are happy that every day sir is with us now i um thank you very much for being with us now i, um, I think our sir will congratulate the all the candidates and um, sir please over to you thank you shana bismillah rahman rahim it is a very great <coughs> pleasure for me to congratulate the newly passed fcps in gynecology really happy Not happen possibly because of our gynae program. And my congratulations to Dr. Sahana as well. She has they have done great job. They have just helped us. And she has she did the thing everything nice. She conducted the study and all these things. Because of this, possibly our candidates have passed it. I would like to see their faces if they are here one by one. And after my lecture, please. So by so many your faces, so that we can congratulate all of you. Time, <coughs> and wish you, I, I want to give you all of you new yes. assignments. Now, now, when you you will be the person to uh, conduct all the things, it will help Dr. Shahana all the time. Thank yes, you all very much. Let us start, Shahana. Sir, I want to introduce them. Dr. Sushmita Bordon. She is our today's the presenter. Yes. And another is Dr. Go Gopakundu. Gopa, please introduce yourself. Gopa. Gopa, are you here? Assalamualaikum, sir. I am Dr. Gopakundu. I have completed uh, FCPS Gynae Oncology from uh, BS Bangladesh Medical University. Your video on. 
Okay. And I'll see you. Maybe nice. If you're nice. Sorry, sir. And I'm sorry again. That's the next. Thank you, sir. Arana Kalam, Obi, Arana Kalam. Obi, Jana Shri Shri Guru, Arana Kalam, Arana Kalam. Arana Kalam. Arana Kalam, are you here? Yes, Assalamualaikum sir. Sir, video Sabrina Thank you. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you, ইউনিভার্সিটি <laughs> They are Dr. Sabriha Sultana, Dr. রহমান আর কে অভি সুস্মিতা আর কে আমি বলছি সবার নাম ডক্টর নাজনিন ক্যান্ডিডেট they have completed their fellowship in gynae oncology this year sir we congratulate to you all before starting our original session we would like to i like to um, tell dr mr mahapush to show the poll questions mahapush please ma'am last day poll winner last day okay you please show the poll winners of the last week Yes, Dr. Pobina Apus, she is from probably BSMU, Dr. Jakia Nahid, she is also from BSMU, Dr. Rita Sharkar, she is also from BSMU. These three are poll winners from the last week. Congratulations to all the poll winners of the last week. And today, the Mahapus now show that today's poll questions.
Ma'am done. Okay, thank you. We are very happy today. The Dr. Bhagdolokhi Nayok, she is with us in our today's program. I want to inform also Dr. Bhagdolokhi. She knows Dr. Farhana Kalam and also the Gopa Kundu. They all they are the Gaini Oncology Fellow this year. I request our scientific secretary, Dr. AFM Kamaluddin Bhai, to congratulate our newly new the fellow of the Gaini Oncology. Kamal Bhai, please. Mahapus, Kamal Bhai ke. Kamal Bhai, please. So we are so happy that uh, Shahana have some uh, soldiers in her fleet. And uh, I'm sure the <coughs> gynae oncology team will be more stronger with this new generation, new blood. And they will carry the this torch, relay race torch forward. And we are WHO is working for cervical cancer-free world. I think now we can dream of gynae oncology disease-free Bangladesh with this courageous team. So we are very hopeful that this new team will do the uh, rest of the job. And very soon, the so-called discussion of lack of trained manpower will be over and our cancer patient will get the best treatment irrespective of the boundary, because I always believe that any patient in any part of the world deserves the best treatment, wherever she is, whoever she is. So I wish that the new gynae oncologist will be doing a great job and looking forward for their wonderful performance. Congratulations to all of you and credit goes to all, including the overseas faculties who have been teaching them silently, politely, and that really, them a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kamal Bhai. We are very happy. Today is our proud moment with this new team. Now I request our the local faculty, Dr. Sushmita Bordon, to present your case. Sushmita, please. Over to you. Am I audible, audible, madam? Yes, you are. Honorable Chairperson, respected foreign faculties and learned audience, very good evening and welcome you all to my today's topic, Jamsil Tumor of the Ovary. Germ cell tumor occupies 20 to 25% of all benign and malignant ovarian tumors. Among the malignant ovarian tumors, 5% uh, are of germ cell origin. The tumors, the ovarian tumors that occurred in first and second decades, 70% of them are germ cell. And they are rapidly going tumor, but they are curable. Germ cell tumors are classified according to their mode of differentiation. Sorry. Sorry. From the primitive germ cells that uh, do not have the potential for further differentiation, uh, digerminoma arise. And from the totipotential germ cell, embryonal carcinoma arise. They are further differentiated into extraembryonic differentiation and embryonal or somatic differentiation. If uh, the differentiation occurs towards the vitaline structures, then yolk sac tumor arise. And if the differentiation occurs towards the trophoblast, Choriocarcinoma arise. And uh, from the somatic or uh, embryonal differentiation, teratomas are arise. Digerminoma are the most common ovarian germ cell malignancies. And 75% occur between the age of 10 to 30 years. 5% may occur in the phenotypic female with abnormal gonads. 65% of the digerminoma are stage one at diagnosis and 85 to 90% of stage one tumors are confined to one ovary. So the fertility sparing surgery play a major role in uh, management of this uh, young age group of 
ovarian malignancies. 10 to 15% of these gelinomas are bilateral. Immature teratoma are the second most common tumor, and less than 1% of all ovarian cancers. Rarely, they occur in postmenopausal women, and uh, they may be associated with glyometosis peritoni. Residual disease after treatment may cause growing teratoma syndrome. Endoderma sinus tumor or eoxic tumor are the third most common, and the median age of diagnosis is 18 years. One third patients are premenarchal, and almost all are unilateral, and all patients should be treated with chemotherapy after surgery. These are the rare germ cell tumors, embryonal carcinoma, choriocarcinoma, polyembryoma. The age group is uh, very young, and um, some of them secret estrogen, which may cause precocious puberty. Mixed germ cell tumors contains two or more elements of tumor, and most common components are dysgerminoma. And the most, most frequent combinations are dysgerminoma and, and uh, endodermal sinus tumor. And the prognosis of the mixed germ cell tumor depends on the size of the primary tumor and the relative percentage of its most malignant component. Now, how this patient can present to us? They may be present with subacute pelvic pain. As these tumors are rapidly growing tumors, they cause the, capsular, the cap, capsular distension, hemorrhage, and necrosis. And these rapidly growing tumors may cause the pressure symptoms on bladder or rectum. And they also may cause, uh, may cause the menstrual irregularities and uh, the young women, uh, young married women uh, sometimes uh, uh, misinterpret uh, these uh, menstrual irregularities with uh, pregnancy and uh, delayed uh, diagnosis may occur. They also may uh, present with acute symptom uh, for torsion and rupture of the tumor. And in advanced case, they may present with ascites or abdominal distension. We can find um, palpable adenexal mass, which are principally solid or solid cystic uh, consistency. And in advanced uh, stage, ascites or pleural effusion or organomegaly can be found. There are some particular tumor markers uh, for germ cell tumors, uh, like uh, lactate dehydrogenase, alpha fetoprotein, human chorionic gonadotropin, and placental alkaline phosphatase. Uh, placental alkaline phosphatase is more uh, useful uh, as an IC marker, even uh, chemistry marker, rather than a serum marker. And uh, dis uh, for dysgerminoma, 95% cases, there is uh, elevated LDH and uh, placental alkaline phosphatase. And uh, they may be, there may be rise of ACG in 3% of uh, dysgerminoma. The immature teratoma, they derive from the embry embryonal tissue and they do not secrete the ACG, but uh, they may cause the elevated of the alpha, elevation of the alpha fetoprotein. Endodermal sinus tumor, uh, in case of in endodermal sinus tumor, alpha fetoprotein markedly rise and there may be rise of uh, LDH. In embryonal carcinoma, uh, both the alpha fetoprotein and ACG markedly elevated. And in choriocarcinoma, ACG uh, is markedly elevated, and there may be rise of uh, placental alkaline phosphatase. Now, uh, how can we evaluate uh, a uh, young patient with a pelvic mass? If the patient is premenarchal and the mass is more than two centimeter, or the mass is uh, two or less than two centimeter with positive markers, we can go for karyotyping and then laparotomy with frozen biopsy. And if the girl is postmenarchal, and the tumor is cystic and uh, negative tumor markers, then we can go for hormones, uh, hormonal suppression for two months. And if the size is decreased, then we can go for follow-up. And if uh, the size is increased or persistence, then we go for surgery. Um, if the tumor is uh, more than eight centimeter solid, uh, co uh, solid consistency and suspicious tumor marker, then we can go for directly for laparotomy and frozen bars. Now, what type of surgery we can do? If fertility desired, unilateral salpingo-ophrectomy with surgical staging. Contralateral ovary, fallopian tube, uh, and uterus uh, should be left in situ, even in the presence of metastatic disease. If fertility not desired, total abdominal hysterectomy and bilateral salpingo-ophrectomy with surgical staging. 
and patients whose karyotype contains Y chromosome. Bilateral salpingophrectomy and uterus may be left in situ for possible embryo transfer. Let's see what the guideline says. If fertility desired, fertility sparing surgery and comprehensive staging. If fertility not desired, complete staging surgery. According to ISGO guideline, they also say the same thing. Uh, in the uh, case of macroscopic bilateral ovarian disease, preservation of at least a healthy part of one ovary, that is unilateral salpingo oophorectomy and contralateral partial oophorectomy, and the uterus should be encouraged unless genetic analysis reveals dysgenetic donors. In the later case, removal of the remaining ovary is encouraged. <coughs> Sorry. Fertility sparing surgery should be considered even in the case of advanced disease because there is high chemosensitivity of the malignant ovarian germ cell tumor. Now, these patients are young, uh, these young patients with unilateral ovarian tumor. What will be the approach? Laparotomy or laparoscopy? Let's say the, uh, what the guideline says median laparotomy is the preferred option in suspected malignant tumor, and a minimally invasive approach is an acceptable option only if the surgeon is trained in laparoscopic oncologic surgery, the removal of the tumor can be performed without rupture, no morcellation of the specimen occurs during the removal, and full exploration of the peritoneal cavity can be done. Um, I said that uh, unilateral salpingoprectomy with surgical staging. So uh, what is uh, the component of the surgical staging in case of germ cell ovarian malignancy? At first, peritoneal, um, uh, before manipulating the tumor, peritoneal fluid should be sent for cytological examination. If there is no fluid in the abdominal cavity, peritoneal washing should be performed. Staging of the tumors also includes examination of the peritoneal surfaces, biopsy of the diaphragmatic peritoneum, paracolic gutters, pelvic peritoneum, examination and palpation of pelvic and paraortic lymph nodes, excision of enlarged lymph nodes, inspection, palpation, and large biopsy of the omentum if normal, removal of adherent or abnormal omentum, and inspection of the contralateral ovary with biopsy of abnormal appearing areas. So there is a difference um, of surgical staging in case of epithelial ovarian cancer and in case of germ cell cancer. Now, if incidental diagnosis after sur surgery, uh, what will be the treatment? There are three options, uh, repeat laparotomy or laparoscopy for surgical staging or surveillance protocols include regular pelvic and abdominal CT or MRI scan and adjuvant chemotherapy or ad adjuvant chemotherapy. Now, what about the adjuvant treatment? In case of stage one dysgerminoma or stage one grade one immature teratoma, their uh, uh, adjuvant treatment uh, is not required and only observation uh, is uh, enough. I previously said that 85% uh, of, of these patients uh, are presented with stage one cancer. So we can um, observe them. And what is the, uh, uh, and uh, these, um, and other the stages, they require adjuvant, therapy, adjuvant chemotherapy. Now, uh, what will be the surveillance protocol? Surveillance should be done by clinical examination, tumor markers, and imaging. And surveillance uh, should be done in the, the cases where there is, uh, we don't, don't go for chemotherapy, only observation. Clinical examination should be monthly for first year, two monthly for second year, three monthly for third year, four monthly for fourth year, five monthly for fifth year, and six monthly for six to 10 years. Uh, six to 10 years. And tumor markers are more frequently done in first year, um, two weekly for first six months, and monthly for seven to 12 months. And from the second year to 10 year, these are uh, similar to the clinical examination. And um, MRI and CT scan of the abdomen uh, done at a, uh, should be done at a three months and at 12 months following the surgery. And a pelvic ultrasonogram and chest x-ray are done on every alternate visit. 
um, beside this, the uh, after the adjuvant therapy, the follow up is similar to the epithelial of ovarian cancer. Chemotherapy is the treatment of choice as these tumors are very sensitive to platinum based chemotherapy. Though these gaminoma are very sensitive to radiation, no radiation is no longer used as loss of fertility and second malignancy are important late effect. New adjuvant chemotherapy followed by fertility sparing surgery may also be a reasonable option for patients with advanced uh, ovarian Janssen tumor uh, that are not suitable for optimal site reduction. Most preferred regimen of chemotherapy uh, are um, bleomycin, etiposide, and cisplatin. So, um, what about the gonadal function? Although the temporary ovarian dysfunction is common, but most common will resume normal ovarian function, and childbearing is usually preserved. Unnecessary bilateral salping ophorectomy and hysterectomy is an important cause of infertility. Older age of initiation of chemotherapy and longer duration of treatment may have adverse effect on future gonadal function. As these tumors are more common in the reproductive age group, so patient may present with pregnancy with the tumor. Uh, in case of stage one cancer, one A cancer, tumor can be removed intact with pre and pregnancy continue and advanced disease, continuation of pregnancy will depend on the gestational age. Chemotherapy can be safely given in second and third trimester in the same doses as given for non-pregnant patient without apparent detriment to the fetus. But few patients reported with fetal malformation and complication. Prognosis of the Jamsel tumors are better than the epithelial ovarian cancer, uh, though there are some uh, risk factors uh, for recurrence, like when the tumor size more than 10 to 15 centimeter is less than 20 years, and uh, in histology, there is numerous mitosis and aplasia medullary pattern. In patient with stage 1A dysgeminoma, unilateral sulfing ophrectomy alone results in a five years disease free survival rate more than 95%. These are all about my pre presentation. Thank you for patience hearing. Thank you, Oncology Club and Professor Sharna Parvin, Madam, for giving me the opportunity to present me in this platform. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Shushmita, for your brilliant presentation. Now I would like to request the, our faculty, one of our mentor, Dr. A.K. Goodman, to present her, to give her presentation. And A.K., please. Thank you so much. First of all, uh, Congratulations to all of you who have accomplished this uh, wonderful moment of becoming an expert in cancer care for women. And I agree with all the comments. Um, it's uh, very moving to me to, to see the, the um, increase in expertise in taking care of women in Bangladesh that has occurred over the past 20 years. It's, it's really, really wonderful. Um, so I'm so proud of you all. I, I'm in awe. And um, uh, Dr. Shushmiya, congratulations. And that was a really, really wonderful presentation. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, I love your slides. They're awesome. OK, so. Um, Thank you, Mayra. Will... Thank you. <laughs> and it's so nice to see you. OK, so uh, let's see if I can give some helpful uh, comments, if I can figure out how to share my screen. Okay, so it says one participant can share at a time. Oh, there we go. I'm technically challenged. All right. So let's go ahead. So you, you all can see my slides? Yes. All right. So basically, um, I know, uh, Dr. Shahana, you would wanted me to talk about a few things, but I'm actually just going to focus on germ cell. It just felt like too much. So. Uh, maybe another day for sex cord stromal tumors. Um, but I wanted to just start with, uh, with a patient I've taken care of, a 15-year-old who, who came in. She had a rapidly expanding abdomen with some tenderness. She continued to have regular menses. She had a past history of having an appendectomy and an inguinal hernia repair uh, when she was a, a small child, but really no other health uh, concerns. And on exam, she was healthy. Um, 
her general exam was just fine, and uh, she had a palpable um, mass in her abdomen. Uh, on pelvic examination, she was virginal, so she did not have a, a internal examination. So in terms of her imaging studies, uh, she had an ultrasound. She actually got the full workup. She got the ultrasound that showed the sort of complex, mostly solid mass, about 10 centimeters by seven centimeters. And then here's your CT scan that shows that it was actually uh, kind of deviating the bladder a little bit. And then here's an MRI that shows it here. Um, <clears throat> so she had um, the workup, as Dr. Shushmia talked about, which included tumor yeah. markers, and her only tumor marker was uh, that I was elevated was the LDH. Okay, okay. She yeah. underwent an ex exploration, not a laparoscopy, because it was felt this tumor might be too big, and there was concern about rupturing it. And she underwent the removal of her right ovary completely, an RSO, and then had right-sided nodal evaluation, omentectomy. Her final pathology <clears throat> showed an intact, a pure dysgerminoma, and all her staging was negative. So that was her story. So <clears throat> looking at the literature, and, and this is uh, beautifully summarized uh, by Dr. Shushmita, but um, actually sort of seeing what the experience is at, at various institutions, here's one from Taiwan um, that uh, looked at the clinical features of 57 patients. And what you see here, this was for a ovarian dysgerminomas, and the breakdown is as as uh, described, the majority are stage one, and um, there is a scattering of advanced stages, and there were 13 who had recurrences. The uh, clinical features, the, min the main clinical feature was uh, presenting with an abdominal mass, some pain, swelling, and then as you see. Uh, interestingly, um, I don't think I knew this, in uh, patients with more advanced stage tumors in this group of patients, the, the uterus was involved in 41 percent, so that's sort of interesting. Um, and this is another just sort of summary review, just looking at what are the outcomes when you do uh, conservative surgery and, and uh, demolitive surgery. I think that just means removing everything, your fertility is demolished. And, uh, what they found looking at these various studies over the years, and this is really, I think, a kind of the back, um, the background to what you see when you see the NCCN guidelines. They come from the summary of collective experience, and, and so that's where I really love to go back and sort of see what exactly it was that they were looking at. And you have, um, throughout these um, two decades of experience, actually almost three, 30 years of experience with all these studies, looking at survival rates, um, the majority were over 90%, and that uh, survival was not really any different whether you did fertility sparing versus complete cytorectal surgery or complete removal of the uterus and tubes and ovaries, and I think this body of information really supports the importance of conservative surgery in young women who have germ cell tumors. Um, interestingly, and I actually um, didn't put the slide in here in my looking at the research, there was a look at who actually got conservative surgery versus a full hysterectomy, and there were some disparities by income, poverty, and so it sort of brings up the issues of women who are more disadvantaged potentially lose their fertility more. So we have to be very thoughtful about that when dealing with poor women to give them the same benefit and opportunity for fertility conservation. What are the risk factors for recurrence in malignant germ cell tumors? Well, histologic type is probably the biggest one, and yolk sac tumors are the um, most, uh, you know, dangerous of the tumors. Uh, having residual tumor was a risk factor. Incomplete surgical staging, and I think the reason incomplete surgical staging may be a risk factor is that it might drive decision making around adjuvant therapy. If you think someone is a stage one, when in fact they are an advanced stage and you might not give them appropriate adjuvant therapy. Age is a risk factor. As you get older, your risk of recurrence and potentially depth, 
death um, increases and stage of course. Interestingly, the majority of recurrences, when they occurred, occurred within the first two years. So just as to uh, Dr. Shusmita's um, comments about follow-up, those first two years are very, very important and very close follow-up. Uh, after a relapse, basically, say you see relapse based on tumor markers or based on x-ray imaging or based on physical examination, you have to be really sure you're dealing with a recurrent malignant germ cell tumor. There is this phenomenon um, with doc that Dr. Shishmita brought up of finding benign, mature teratomas that sort of this maturation effect, this is mostly true when you're dealing with an immature teratoma, but they're found frequently and therefore before you rush to giving someone chemotherapy, you want to be really sure you're dealing with a recurrent malignancy. Okay, so uh, here's another, I thought, really nice um, summary of a very large institutional experience, a single institutional experience of 65 patients. This is in Saudi Arabia. And here, in pure uh, dysgerminomas, the median age was 20. Uh, the majority of these patients underwent fertility sparing surgery, close to 80 percent. Um, and um, 40 of them received chemotherapy and a few received uh, radiation. There was a medium follow-up of 54 months. You see here a conglomerate disease-free survival of 88 percent, overall survival of 95 percent. And uh, what they found in their group of 65 patients was giving adjuvant chemotherapy was an independent prognostic factor for improved disease-free survival. So that's sort of interesting. Um, of those 50 patients who had fertility sparing surgery, 16 were able to achieve pregnancy. That seemed a little lower to me than what we see in a, sort of the conglomerate literature. Um, and again, they found that there was no difference in outcome and survival, whether you had conservative surgery versus um, full hysterectomy. Now, here's another sort of summary of many, many studies that have looked at what exactly are the reproductive outcomes when you do conservative management in the setting of a malignant ovarian germ cell tumors. And that conservative management includes both surgery plus surgery plus chemotherapy. So there's a conglomerate there. And as you see here, here's the sort of numbers uh, of uh, women who underwent conservative surgeries in the various uh, groups. And um, basically, here's the percentages of those who are able to get pregnant, okay? So um, in general, it's pretty good when you look at the literature, much better than uh, what we saw in Saudi Arabia. I'm not sure why. Okay, so here is sort of an overall flow chart of a fertility pres preser preservation strategy. And I really like this sort of decision diagram here. What you see here is the um, sort of basically counseling. You have a malignant tumor. Uh, you sort of uh, make a decision here about whether you're going to not do chemotherapy versus chemotherapy. And then you sort of decide, are you going to give it right away? Or are you going to, uh, you know, are, are they pregnant? And so forth. So there's sort of this flow of where do you go with all this. And this even includes um, using uh, artificial reproductive te technology, assisted reproductive technology to help getting pregnant. So, so I thought it was a nice flow to sort of think with your patients when um, you're thinking about pregnancy. Now, I want to spend the rest of the time talking about chemotherapy. Y you know, when in gynecologic oncology, there's different around the world um, uh, practice patterns. Some places, gynecologic oncology, oncologists also give chemotherapy. Other places, uh, they're referred to colleagues in medical oncology who give the chemotherapy. Regardless of your practice, you need to know about chemotherapy and you need to know about the outcomes, the side effects, the potential dangers of it. So I sort of wanted to kind of go through that with you. Um, here is the classic, classic gynecologic oncology um, clinical trial that really has led to our current standard of care that was uh, reported in the early 1990s. 
okay? And basically it was a, a 93 patients with malignant germ cell tumors who all received three cycles of cisplatin, bleomycin, and etoposide and were followed and monitored, okay? Uh, there was moderate acute chemotherapy toxicity, which I will talk about more in the following slides. The majority of these patients, 89 out of 93, um, had complete clinical response with no recurrence. Two patients had a recurrence of immature teratoma, and this is very important. One patient developed acute uh, myelomonocytic leukemia. Um, about two years after therapy, and one patient developed a lymphoma about five years after therapy. So that's about a 2% leukemia rate with three cycles of chemotherapy. I want you to hold on to that piece of information. Okay, so let's talk about this, these three drugs. These are our kind of go-to drugs for germ cells, cisplatinum. And you all know that cisplatinum works by basically causing intra- and interstrand crosslinks with DNA and preventing DNA cell replication. There's a lot of short-term effects. It's a highly emetogenic drug, highly emetogenic. Um, you also have peripheral neuropathy that can persist from short-term to long-term. Nephrotoxicity is probably the most life-threatening toxicity of cisplatinum, and prior to our understanding how to manage that with um, extreme hydration, really, really pushing hydration, uh, renal failure was quite common. You can still get chronic renal insufficiency, even in well-managed patients, chronic magnesium wasting, and uh, you have this hit on the um, distal tubules in the kidneys causing acute distal tubular necrosis. So very, very important to hydrate your patients and then to monitor their renal function as part of your long-term management. I've had several patients who are now on dialysis years and years after surviving their cancers. Nausea, vomiting, I've talked about, is it a short-term? Myelosuppression is a short-term. Ototoxicity is another um, issue, tinnitus, um, the loss of high frequency hearing um, is something that's important. And if your patients report about ringing in their ears, you need to get um, audiograms. You need to evaluate their hearing, okay? So it's important to take that responsibility. Atoposide, uh, hair loss, emetogenic, causes nausea, vomiting. If you give it too fast, if you infuse it too fast, you can get hypotension during the infusion, so it's important to infuse it slowly, diarrhea, mouth sores. Long term, sometimes it can impact a premature ovarian failure, so loss of fertility. Myelosuppression is the dose-limiting side effect of atoposide, and I just sort of wanted to point out that all chemotherapy agents have their own signature nadir, their lowest point of the white count. And for um, etoposide, it's about 7 to 14 days. That's much shorter than, say, carboplatinum taxol, which we're much more familiar with with epithelial ovarian cancer, where the nadir is 10 to 14 days. And again, leukemia is the big danger. It's the big danger. And in a large series that looked at using Atoposide, which is a topoisomerase 2 inhibitor, um, there was a, a incidence of 2 to 12 percent of leukemia. It was not, interestingly, it was not dose dependent. Um, it might be that there are certain genetics that a patient has that put them, make them more uh, susceptible to leukemia. But the tragedy of a chemotherapy induced leukemia is that it is not as treatable as other leukemias. And um, personally, the women I've taken care of who've developed this have all died of their leukemia. So it is a very significant, rare, but very significant side effect. Bleomycin um, <clears throat> can short-term give fevers, myelosuppression, um, al allergic reaction, mucositis, and so forth. The significant long-term side effect is pulmonary fibrosis, and this is a dose-dependent effect. And when you are thinking about three versus four cycles of bleomycin in your patients, please, please 
think about this issue because it's a dose dependent effect and pulmonary fibrosis can be fatal. This is actually from the literature. This is not a patient of mine, a picture of someone's lungs and this woman died. Okay, so this is a very life threatening risk. Should you start to see people getting short of breath, you need to get pulmonary function tests. And I've actually started getting baseline pulmonary function tests on my patients if they're gonna receive bleomycin so I can follow that side effect. So let's finish up by talking about fertility consequences of chemotherapy. Three cycles of cisplatin-based chemotherapy is associated with a higher risk of premature menopause. As Dr. Shushmita talked about, most people are fine and most people do not have this and we have the data to show that reproductive outcomes are good, but it's not universal, okay? Uh, on the bright side, it's not really associated with any um, impact in terms of genetic or other defects in, in subsequent pregnancies for those women who have survived their malignant germ cells, uh, tumors. Um, this is a very nice paper that uh, looked at um, fertility sparing surgery and chemotherapy and uh, reproductive outcome over a 15 year um, uh, follow up. And what you see here is that the number of chemotherapy cycles is uh, relates to the ability to get pregnant. So I thought that was a nice graphic, you know, less chemo, more likely to get pregnant, right? That's the blue, more chemo, less likely to get pregnant. So I thought that was a sort of a good thing to keep in mind. Um, now, just as a final interesting point, there's been a lot of studies, and this is um, not just for malignant germ cell tumors, this is for all young uh, women who undergo chemotherapy for whatever reason, to try and protect their, their ovarian function and protect them from ovarian failure. And here is a series um, of studies that have looked at the use of GnRH um, uh, agonists to suppress the ovaries and protect them during the time that they're on chemotherapy. And there seems to be sort of a signal you see here in the scatter plot uh, where the, the odds ratio of protecting um, ovarian function is greater with the use of GnRH agonists. So something for you to consider when your patients, uh, your young women who have had their ovaries preserved who then need chemotherapy is to maybe suppress their ovaries with GnRH agonists. Okay. So with that in mind, let's go back to our patient, our 15-year-old. So she had this stage 1A pure germ cell tumor. Does she need chemotherapy? Well, Dr. Uh, Shushmita already told us, by, based on the NCCN guidelines, she probably doesn't. But sometimes you do do it, and there is some information that um, your risk of recurrence is dependent on size of the tumor. She had a 10-centimeter uh, tumor. And, that's right at that borderline where you start to think about giving chemotherapy or not. So here is my last study to just uh, share with you, which is just recently published from uh, the MITO trial, the multicenter Italian trials in ovarian cancer. And this looked at surveillance alone in stage one malignant germ cell tumors over time. They were followed over about 46 months. This study was, uh, uh, an observational perspective study from 2013 to 2019, and they divided their patients into these three groups. Group A was 13 uh, girls, uh, women who had stage 1A dysgerminomas and uh, a, a, a 1A1 immature teratoma, and the group B, 29 patients had uh, a little bit more advanced stage 1 dysgerminomas, immature teratoma, and some mixed tumors. And then the group C was five patients with uh, 1C tumors. They looked at 45 patients, and of these, 31% received chemotherapy and 68% had surveillance alone. One patient in the group A group had a relapse that was controlled and she was cured with management with surgery and chemo. No one else who had observation alone relapsed. Their conclusion is that close surveillance in a well-staged, and this is very, very important, a well-staged um, uh, patient who really truly has a stage one, you're, you're not worried, you're missing 
um, something that's a higher stage, can be followed without chemotherapy. And just a word about staging, one more word, which is if you think about the ovary, the ovary, the gonadal vessels, the infundibular pelvic ligament on the right side drains into the inferior vena cava at the level of the renal vessels, and on the left side, it drains into the renal vein. If you have nodal metastatic disease, your most likely place to see nodal metastatic disease will be at the high aortics. You may have negative pelvic nodes because that is not where these ovaries drain to. So if you do not do high periortics as part of your staging, you have an incompletely staged patient. So that's a very important point. All right, so basically, my, my girl, um, basically with her 10 centimeter stage 1A pure, this germinoma was followed. She's been followed over the past seven years, and she's currently in medical school doing fine. So that's my lecture, and uh, thank you so much for allowing me to participate in this wonderful conference. Thank you, E.K., for your nice deliberation. Now the we have the questions. If we have the worry of germ cell tumor, in that cases, if there's the advanced, what is the role of the new adjuvant chemotherapy in case of the advanced germ cell ovarian tumor? Yeah, so this is interesting. I actually, um, until I went to Bangladesh, I'd never seen anyone get neoadjuvant chemotherapy for germ cell. I mean, I think in general, uh, you think about starting with surgery. I do know that in Bangladesh, you all are faced with patients who have neglected disease, neglected disease. So you will have uh, a girl come from the village who's had symptoms for a long time and is coming in with big, bulky, widespread disease. Uh, actually, I think it was with uh, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Lutfa, we had a patient that we took care of at, um, at DMCH uh, where uh, this girl died, you know, and she came in with this advanced, advanced um, uh, tumor. Um, so I think that it's really dependent on the situation. In an ideal world, you have a teenager coming in with a rapidly growing mass. You do your imaging studies, you see a mass, you have tumor markers that are elevated. The first thing you do is surgery. But pragmatically, you have people with big neglected disease. You do an FNAC that shows it's a germ cell tumor. They're not stable. They are not well. They're very, very sick. I understand that you might consider it. What I would say is I don't know that you have the clinical trials to support it, and I don't know that you can jump to the conclusion that it is of the same level of efficacy that we have in epithelial tumors where we have the Vergoat study that shows equivalency in survival in epithelial tumors. We don't really have that information in germ cell tumors. So you are basically doing it as a case-by-case -case basis, all right? So that would be my only caution to you, is if you can, you should operate and remove it, okay? Um, Finally, also because you really want to see what the histology is, and sometimes your FNAC will be wrong. You will have a false um, pathology, and you're not dealing with what you think you're dealing with. So just to be careful. Yeah. Yes. Sometimes you get these types of the tumor with advanced stages, the germ cell tumor. In that cases, we may do the new adjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery. Even after that, they, sometimes the patients, they lost for the follow-up. And again, they come with the recurrence. In that cases, what should be her next, the chemotherapy, the same, the BP regime, or anything more? There's many different chemotherapies. Uh, and I would say that's always, when someone comes in with recurrent disease, uh, you ask the question, do they have chemosensitive versus chemoinsensitive disease? And again, you're dealing with a very different group of patients because they've been lost to follow up. So they're very sick. Um, <laughs> You have to navigate that. Um, you know, if you think about just biologically, germ cell tumors have a very high growth rate. Most of it's in S phase, 
Um, and therefore, that's why it's so exquisitely chemosensitive. And I actually want to maybe turn this over to uh, Dr. Kamal, you know, who does a lot of chemotherapy, right, and, and, and has a lot of insight into this. So I might want to turn it over to you. My feeling is you could probably try anything like carboplatinum taxol, like alfosfamide, like VAC, you know, vincristine, um, actinomycin, D-cytoxin. Those are all the agents. But, but Kamal, what are your thoughts about this? So normally what we say that uh, we follow the, um, in every side, more than six month story. If it is more than six months, we can challenge with the same drug. But definitely I will take out the blamycin because I was listening to your lecture about the lady that you lost. I mean, this is a drug we all are scared of. You know, everybody's life, we have some accident with bleomycin. And we don't know when it will happen, how it will happen. So sometimes we feel like taking out the drug, but it is so good that we cannot take it out. So, I mean, if something like that, maybe I will re-challenge with EP, uh, uh, not bleomycin. Uh, if it is more than six months or one year, or as you said, it is such a chemosensitive drug, we can pick anything like iphosphamide, texol, it normally responds. And there are a good number of different protocol, but we don't need to jump into higher end because we need to go with the lower end because these are very chemosensitive tumor. Uh, I mean, uh, we always look at the cost of the tumor treatment, but we don't look at the sufferings of the chemotherapy. So we need to handle them very gently, I mean, as minimum as possible, and where there is no requirement. Now, the world is looking for de-escalation of treatment. Once we have been chasing with escalation of the treatment, now I think in surgery, chemotherapy, everywhere, we are trying to be precise and de-escalate and quality of life. So as this is a very good responding tumor, I will try to chase with the old drug. And if not, then we select one of them another. And as you said, there's a long list of protocol. But uh, I, I want to caution that for more than two cycles, on third cycle onwards, we should be very cautious about bleomycin. It is a killer and it can happen anytime. And uh, another thing that you mentioned about the second malignancies, these are long-term survivor. Now, like many pediatric cancer, good survivor, people are now really scared of the second malignancy due to drug or radiation. So that is another issue that we need to really keep in mind because they are going to survive for long. And I love the uh, paper that you showed about the GHS analog, analog uh, pregnancy. That is a very interesting thing. And these are the things, very small thing that probably we are not considering because most of the patients are very young. And just to give an injection every 28 days could make a good separation and at the end of the day, it can really give out a very good result. We most time ignore it. And I think sometimes we pay for it because and for some unfortunate lady lost the fertility, even the percentage is low. So it is a very simple thing. We can suppress the ovarian suppression and the result is wonderful as you so have shown. I really love that paper. Thank you and Catherine. I have a question to Dr. Kamal. We have several times we have seen that the many of our patients they are getting the BB sometimes four cycle, five cycle. What is the your message to that? There is no protocol in the whole world to give more than three cycle of BB. No guideline, no recommendation. If anybody, if somebody is not responding, then we need to look for surgery. We need to go in, take out the retro peritoneal. I mean, we need to think that something is wrong beyond three cycle, not respond that chasing with more cycle of chemotherapy is not recommended. Either you change the drug or you go for intervention, not BEP. For God's sake, highest is four cycle and there they say that switch to EP, not BEP. Beyond three, no B. And beyond four okay. cycle, there is no recommendation. Fourth cycle is EP or only EP? Fourth cycle. Fourth cycle is only EP. If it is beyond three, it should be EP. Normally, I say that if beyond two also, try to avoid B. Because it is safe to, if we are thinking that I'm going for four, then maybe after two cycle, we can switch to EP for two more cycles. But 
five six cycle i know many people of our colleagues we are practicing it which is not as per recommendation maybe this is our own uh, experience based practice which is probably not that strong data thank you um, kamal Kamal, there was a question, um, which is a great question, about can you give BEP in pregnancy? And I'm curious what your thoughts are about that. Which one? Sorry? Can you, can you give BEP, B-E-P, in pregnancy? Uh, I am not sure about it, but the, I think the rule is that the first trimester and second trimester story that we follow for breast cancer, I mean, once this first trimester is gone, probably we can because I have no specific idea about that there is any special, because all more or less chemotherapy follow the same uh, pattern of teratogenic effect. And what we say that we avoid it on first trimester. If it was second trimester, I think we can give. But again, the discussion is that we know, should know nothing is 100% safe. So if somebody asks that, are you sure it is not going to harm anything? you can say that there is a minimum chance of harm. Probably, bluntly, we cannot say there is no harm. So normally we say if it's life-threatening, we give after the first trimester, then we can give. In breast cancer, we do, but for BEP, I have no definite data, but probably we can follow the same, extrapolate the data of breast cancer. Because in breast cancer, we are giving hexane, we are giving endoxane, cyclophosphamide. So probably it is the same group. Yeah, I think so. Um, so there's a really great question. A 13-year-old uh, with a immature um, teratoma advanced stage received four cycles of BEP, but no response. Um, should, should we undergo surgery? So I guess my question is, did she ever have surgery to start, or is this someone that just had an FNAC? If she just had an FNAC, you don't know. You may have the wrong diagnosis. You absolutely need to do surgery on this girl. You know, so on the other hand, if you've already done surgery on this girl and it was an advanced stage and you've taken out her ovary and staged her and now you've given her the BEP and she has progression, you have a very, very sick patient who has a very worrisome thing. And I wouldn't do surgery again. I would do probably VAC, you know, uh, vincristine, um, actinomycin D and cytoxin. So really the issue is if this girl has not had any surgery, she needs surgery, you do not know you have the right diagnosis. You need to take that out. Okay, Catherine, I want to add that first of all, I will go back to the old slide to yeah. review because whether it is a pure case or a mixed case, we don't know. Yeah. Sometimes this preferred to be a mixed type of tumor that we are missing some small component which is not chemosensitive. So as you know, it is a heterogeneous tumor. Some part of the tumor probably was taken as a core or FNA, and the poor histopathologist has given the report and we are dealing with that. But unless we take out the tumor, the ovary, and we go the cross-section of the whole, and even a small component of something that was the main culprit, if we cannot identify, giving six more cycle of BEP will not solve. So in this situation, most important is that we need to clear that our existing diagnosis is correct. As you said, sometimes we are treating on FNSC and core, which is not correct. We need to take out the lump, I mean, tissue, and we see it. Then only, uh, because in, in male cancer, we see the seminoma treating, then finally found out there was a non seminomatous germs that tumor component was there. It loves to stay together, but when it is a small component, we need to treat it together as a non seminar The same thing here. There is a small component that changed the whole game. So we were thinking the chemo responder, it was not a response. So I think very important, we need to look at the pathology in details. Yes. Now I'd like to request Dr. Bhagulokhi Nayak. Bhagulokhi Nayak, please comment on the two days presentations and about our students. Dr. Haggulu, can I please? Yeah, very good evening, Dr. Shana. Uh, I actually joined a little late during Sushmita's talk. So, uh, of course, it is very nice. And I also myself have one question to Dr. AK, that what is her take on omentectomy in germ cell tumors? Is she there? Can we take uh, her uh, comment? Yes. AK? 
Yeah. You are muted. Um, well, you know, I think for, um, it depends on if you think there's going to be intraperitoneal spread, right? So dysgerminomas probably no intraperitoneal spread, right? I mean, that you think about as spreading uh, through the lymphatics. However, your other germ cell tumors, your endodermal sinus tumor, your immature teratomas actually spread peritoneally as well. So I, I think doing a, an omentectomy makes sense. Thank you for your question. Thank you so much. And uh, about the new adjuvant chemotherapy, I really have reservations that we really need to have a true cut biopsy, image guided true cut biopsy before going for a chemotherapy. And number two is that in case chemotherapy is not responding, that should really give us a cue that it's not a uh, appropriate germ cell tumor that we are treating. So I think it's not important, not uh, ideal to waste those chemotherapy cycles and uh, reduce the quality of life of the woman. So in a case in two cycles, if she is not responding, I think we have to change the diagnosis, take some other steps for that. Okay. I would like to request Dr. Rupinder Shekhan, ma'am. Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you, Shahana, for uh, asking me to give my comments. So it's been an excellent presentation, and though I joined later on, and uh, uh, AK's uh, exposition was, of course, fantastic. I have uh, only one uh, comment to add, if I may. See, germ cell tumor, of course, we know is a tumor of the younger age group, but as we approach the 30 year uh, barrier, I think uh, before we actually address this, we need to do an AMH. Find out how much is the ovarian reserve? Is fertility preservation surgery worth doing or not? So this is uh, just a thought that uh, if we have an AMH before we address the patient, uh, then perhaps if she has, if her AMH is very low, then there's really no point in uh, doing any kind of fertility preserving surgery. She might as well have uh, all of it out and um, thorough procedure rather than uh, increasing the chances of recurrence. This is just my thought on it. I don't know. I would invite comments from uh, anybody who wishes to say anything. I think that's a very brilliant point, and thank you for bringing that up. Uh, and as you see, age is actually a prognostic factor in germ cell tumors too. So yeah. you're, 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 you're sort of kind of navigating that with your older population. Um, so, yeah. so it's a great, great thought. Thank you. Yeah, there are some questions in the chat box. Before that, two people raised hand. Mahapus, please. Two people raised hand. People unmute them. Mahapus? Madam, who are they? Probably one was dope something, dope. This is. Yes, there is a question. 13 years old girl is a diagnosed case of immature teratoma, advanced stage, four cycle BP given, but no response. Should we go for the surgery or CT change schedule? I think it is already answered. Most of the patients come to us with FNAC from the remote center. It is one of someone's comment. And another question is Dr. Shanti Ahmed. Is there any role of second loop laparotomy here? Um, yes, so the second loop laparotomy would be important if you identify um, something on your imaging study, and you need to be sure it's not just mature teratoma, what we talked about before. So, um, but otherwise, with normal tumor markers, negative scans, I don't think there's any role for second look laparotomy. That's sort of more was done back in the 1990s, 1980s, when the field was sorting out what would be the standard of care. For instance, the paper. Oh, yeah. got, the GOG paper uh, from 1994. Marcus, who raised that hand, please. Marcus? Ma'am, I want to add about the second look laparotomy. Uh, let me share one experience. Shahana is also part of that. 
that if anybody after going for a surgery, there is a suspicion that by radiologically that the uh, ovary was not properly taken out or something is left behind, it is wise to go for second look laparotomy rather than chasing. I had an experience, I treated a patient and there was some uh, suspicious thing in the CT scan and we were giving a benefit of doubt that it is a post-operative changes. And after three cycle or four cycle, I can remember then when we open up, we found there was a residual tumor left. And then the girl is like your one, the surgery was done and now she became a mother. That is the most important part. We made a counseling that we will never become a mother, but you know, nature has its own way. And that was a interesting experience for me that we were so confident about the surgery by some of my colleagues and we gave chemotherapy and it was not going down. And then the second look laparotomy gave us a clue that unfortunately there was something left behind. So I think there is always a need if clinically or radiologically I have a suspicion that something is left behind. Catherine, what do you say? I agree. Um, I you, you know, this is definitely a situation where your best evaluation is surgical and uh, the, the, the stakes are high. So um, important to follow your clinical judgment there. If you have any questions, please raise your hands. Is there anybody? Probably two people raised and I can remember their name. One probably dope, something dope. Mahfuz. Mahfuz? Okay. It, it, it's okay. I was going to say, unfortunately, I, I do need to leave, um, but I, I'm, I, I have to go do some family things now but but i i um i thank you so much for the opportunity and i look forward to seeing you next week so thank you so much so, Catherine, I uh, want to so, say you, goodbye. so you have enjoyed the virtual party of shahana shahana is celebrating today today she is in a festive mood so mm -hmm. she has thrown a virtual party so enjoy the virtual party today because she hey. is the most happy person in the whole world today so it is a virtual party. You, Bhagya, uh, Rupinder, everybody is invited to join the virtual party. And the real party is pending for next year when you will come physically. Yeah. Inshallah. Yeah. In our oncology club program, Inshallah. Inshallah. Inshallah, guys. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. Bye, many bye, okay. bye, Catherine. Many bye. blessings. Joanne, yeah. thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Very bye. Much. Yeah. bye bye. Okay, bye bye. Anything else now? Yes, I think there is no question. See if there is another new message. What is that? Dr. Anji possibly raised her hand. Yes, there is another question. What is Anji. the meaning of the limited surgical staging? Dr. Ma'am, please. What is the meaning of limited surgical staging? There is no such scientific term as limited surgical staging, if I may say so. Because if you are staging a patient, you are staging a patient, or you are not yes. doing complete staging. Yes. So limited surgical staging has no, no basis. Yes. For some reason, if you are unable to stage a patient, that's all right. Sometimes yes. we have patients who come to us who have got surgery done, and uh, subsequent to that, the diagnosis is say, uh, you know, uh, either a dysgerminoma, they're not sure whether it's a pure dysgerminoma or otherwise, and it has been improperly staged, and they do not want to address it again, and they don't want to go in for a second look uh, or something, and they want to either put the, uh, keep the patient for observation 
or maybe just give a limited uh, four cycle or three cycle chemotherapy. That's all right. Okay. Uh, that can sometimes, but to do a limited surgical staging has got no rule. I don't know if Bhagya would agree with me or no, if she's still yeah. there. <laughs> I think if there is no other questions, then we can get to the poll question again and then we can conclude the session. Mahfuz, please show the poll questions again. Dr. Shahana? Yeah. Uh, can, uh, very good evening to you all. Dr. Yeah. Shahana, Dr. Kamal, yeah. uh, Anju here from. Okay. Anju, yeah, good evening. Yeah, just good evening. Uh, just I, I joined actually very late, but I had a question. Uh, anyone can uh, I mean answer it. Uh, Dr. Rupinder, Dr. Bhagya, or anyone. Uh, uh, recently, we we're also getting very uh, large number of young girls having this uh, simple ovarian as well as germ cell tumors. Uh, recently, we get a case who had a bilateral dysgerminoma. Very young. I think it's uh, she's around 18 years old. In that case, uh, it, it, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's only limited to ovary 8 or 9 centimeter tumor. So it should be, it's a, uh, difficult to, uh, I mean, um, uh, judge how to, uh, I mean, should we go ahead with the bilateral nephrectomy or should we do unilateral nephrectomy and biopsy from the other? I mean, how should we uh, manage such cases? What is the age of the patient? 18 years. 18 years. Yeah, unmarried. Unmarried girl. As we know that the germ cell tumor, it is a and highly curable disease. So yeah. if it is a bilateral and if it is an advanced stage, in that cases we can go we can go for the chemotherapy, the new adjuvant chemotherapy, then and not only that we can give the chemotherapy and we can uh, follow up the patient. There is uh, even after advanced stage disease, there is the role of the uh, uh, conservative surgery in case of the ovarian malignancy. Rupinder, ma'am, please. Are you there? Yes, yes, I'm there. Um, so I think um, I would slightly disagree over here <coughs> after conserving the ovaries. Yes, it is a very curable disease. And yes, it responds very well to chemotherapy. All of it is correct and right only if you follow the laid down guidelines. Nowhere in the guidelines do they say that when there is a tumor there, you let the tumor and uh, give chemotherapy on, on it. No. The dictum is that you have to operate and after you have operated, if it is a stage 1A disease, then perhaps you must not give chemotherapy. But if it is anything beyond that, you have to give chemotherapy. So uh, if she is 18 years old and uh, uh, she's got bilateral dysgeominoma, uh, Anju, like you said, I think yes. I do, there is any role of conserving the ovaries. Uterus can definitely be conserved because these days with the present um, assisted reproductive techniques, yeah. we uh, do uh, an embryo transplantation, you know, from a donated ovum and so on. And uh, she can have a successful pregnancy, though of course the, ov the uh, ova would not be her own. But apart from that, she can have a successful pregnancy. So it is worth trying. But I, if the tumor in the ovary, there is no point in tumor. I do not see but, uh, but, madam, we have a patient discussed last week. We have a patient, we discussed it in our <coughs> board. The patient, it has a yak tumor and she has a bilateral ovarian tumor, unilateral sulfingoprectomy, women take to me, lymphadenectomy, and biopsy from opposite ovary was taken. There was the uh, yak sac tumor on, with pregnancy, with 16 weeks pregnancy. And opposite ovary, there was also the metastatic disease, also the omental metastasis. Even after that, she after the surgery, she received chemotherapy and now she is on chemotherapy. She is now in 20, probably 16 weeks her surgery was done. And now it is her 24 weeks pregnancy, as far as I know, and her pregnancy is continuing. So Shahana, she conceived before this ovarian tumor was discovered, isn't it? 
It was advanced stage along with ascites. The patient presented no, at forty weeks. Yeah, that can happen. But there is a, then all when she was diagnosed, there was already an ongoing pregnancy. She did not get pregnant after she after the treatment, right? So what you have done is perfectly in order. Having said that, there is one more thing that I would uh, want to say that there really is no role of biopsy from the opposite ovary or a veg section biopsy that we used to do from what is termed as a normal looking ovary. No, it, it was so time that yeah. we no no I'm mean, not for this case I'm just yeah. saying yeah the only time that we would want to do um, any kind of biopsy from the uh, from the opposite ovary or from yeah. the uh, so to say the, not the diseased ovary is when we see some external extra senses or maybe some deposits on that ovary and we would take away those and then send it for frozen section and then find out whether that ovary is involved or not. Because in ovary, you can have a focus of malignancy which you might completely miss out when you are taking a biopsy. So we no longer biopsy a normal looking ovary. If we are doing fertility preserving surgery for any patient whosoever you, and the uh, other ovary, so to say, which is not diseased, looks normal, we just let it be. So that is the current standard of care. So I just wanted to add that. Kamal Bhai, please. Do you like to add anything, Kamal Bhai? Yes. The Dr. Unju, she has questions the bilateral determinum, 18 years girl. What should be her treatment plan? So I heard both of you, you and Rupinder, Dr. Rupinder was yes. mentioning. I will say that it will not go by book. Uh, you need to discuss with the patient and then uh, we, we can try to keep the fertility and if there is a response, then go for the pregnancy and then the completion surgery. That is the way we can go. But uh, again, we need to, then it, I think this is not a uh, clean cut, Thing that if ideal world you need to sacrifice, but is she considering her 18 years old and good response to chemotherapy? If it is possible, we can try for preservation and go for pregnancy by giving chemotherapy. So that is the sympathetic attitude. Now, the yes, thing is, I, like, I, I agree, Rupinder. I, I, I say that if it is go by science, you just take, take it. Yeah. That, you know? yeah, yeah. But, Life is more important than fertility. Yes. Is that yes. I, totally, I totally agree. If if you so go by book, yeah, your point is well taken. I agree, and of course, the uh, crux of the whole thing is Kamal that we need to do very very good counselling. That's yes. Important. Yeah, I think uh, Shana, can I put in one word? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah about this disgerminoma. Actually, this is a very difficult uh, thing to take a decision because many times. It's not possible <laughs> to find normal ovarian tissue. Exactly. So I think in exactly. those cases, you really have to counsel them well. And of course, uh, doing an AMH before that is uh, also okay. But uh, then the other thing is, I just wanted to tell you about the sec Sometimes after the chemotherapy is over, sometimes there may be multiple masses in the abdomen, but the tumor markers are normal. This is two, three cases we have already had of a growing teratoma syndrome. And they'll never respond to any chemotherapy. So in those cases, I think uh, secondary surgery or secondary surgery, whatever has a role. They may not be um, uh, like malignant tumors, but they really metastasize to the whole peritoneal cavity and especially uh, following immature teratomas. So growing teratoma syndrome is a cause of concern and that needs surgery and it will not never respond to any chemotherapy. Mahapus. Mahapus? Yes, ma'am. Yes, they, somebody has written here that they sometimes they don't read the link. I have talked that, ask you the please collect the, all the email ID and the, send them to Tanya so she can send the invitation letter to all the participants on our this platform. There is a, um, you please see the Dr. Nita. The hello, ma'am. Your discussion are very useful. Is there any way eh, where we can be a part of this discussion regularly? Sometimes we don't receive link. I have told you several times. You please the, collect the, all the email ID and please send uh, 
Tanya, so she can send the email and the invitation letter to all the participants of this platform. Kamal Bhai. Okay. Kamal Bhai. Yes. Yes. Um, I think your attention is necessary here. So we are working on a China. We had some issue on mail. Yes. Mail sending because the this uh, normal mail there was some missing of mail. So we're working on it, and hopefully very soon this will be solved. Okay, thank you. I think we are the we have come to the end of this discussion and we are very happy for the lovely discussions of the today's program. And before ending the session, we'd like to I would like to request Mahapus to show the poll questions again and the, all the participants are requested to for poll voting and the winner will be that there will be announced the next program and two days the winner are Dr. Obina, Dr. Rita Rani, and another Mahapus, three participants from here, Dr. Obina, Rita Rani, and another one, Mahapus. Well, just a minute. Yeah. You please, the, all the three the winners, they are requested to uh, put their the uh, cell number on the chat box so we can communicate with you. Yeah. Dr. Zakia Nahid, yes, all three, they, you please, I think their cell number is me, Ubina Zakia Nahid and also the Rita Rani, yeah, the show the poll questions again. Sheila Duvas Moody, which is present in the Brenner Center, in the Dunham Center School. Yes, ম্যাম ডান Thank you to all the participants for participating in this the platform. And I think that we are all are happy today for these sessions. And I request thanks to all the foreign faculties, the all our the local faculties, and also the participants and all our students. And we are happy for participate all of your participation and think you will continue your participation in this program. And I would like to give a vote of thanks to Dr. A.P.M. Kamaluddin Bhai for these sessions. And all at the end of that, I would like to end the conclude the session. So Dr. A.M. Bhai, sir, have another program, please. Kamal Bhai, please. I think Kamal Bhai, she is, he is our evening sender. Well, are you there or have we left? OK, sir, sir, please conclude the session, sir. Come on, I left. Come on, boys. Sir, please conclude the session, sir. Okay, thank you, Shana. It was a great session.
Now we are able to lost copy from Kathleen Catherine. Now so Kathleen Shaker, Anjali, Anjali, Thanks to every one of them. We are really happy, and I'm also happy because our own crafts also is to develop this ecological service in this country to the government. Yes, we are doing our entire development process is going on, and that we can get this serious result from this. I'm really happy, and thank you all, everybody.